Hello and welcome to Diplomatically Speaking, a FPRC initiative of video interviews with distinguished guests to share their views on various aspects of Indian foreign policy. I'm Zoya Ansari, pursuing honors in political science from Zakir Hussain Delhi College, University of Delhi. Today we have with us Ambassador Anil Badwa, sir, to throw light on vital issues relating to Indian foreign policy and relations. Ambassador Anil Badwa, sir, served the Indian Foreign Service from 1979 to 2017 as a member and has represented his country as the Indian ambassador to Italy, Thailand, Oman, Poland, San Marino, and Lithuania. During his tenure as Secretary East in the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, he oversaw foreign relations with Southeast Asia and West Asia, the Gulf, the Pacific, and Australasia. In addition to his service as the Indian ambassador, he also held the position of permanent representative to FAO, IFAD, WFP, UN Escape, and headed the government relations, media and public affairs branches of OPCW in The Hague. Ambassador Vadva sir has been India's chief delegate to the East Asia Summit, ASEAN India Summit, Asia Europe Meeting Summit, ASEAN Cooperation Dialogue, the Arab League, Mekong Ganga Cooperation, and the ASEAN Regional Forum Meetings. He has been leading the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII Task Force, for writing the Australia Ambassador economic strategy report for the government of India. Ambassador Vadva sir currently also holds the position of being a distinguished fellow with the Vivekanand International Foundation, New Delhi, and contributes as an independent director on the boards of major corporations. Now I hand over to Professor Mahendra Bhar, sir, director FPRC to continue the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Zoya. Uh, I welcome uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador Vajva to this program and uh, I hope we will benefit uh, from his valuable views on different aspects of uh, India's foreign policy. Uh, sir, uh, can you hear us and uh, see us? Yes, can hear you properly and, and okay. see you also. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, once again, let me thank you for sparing time uh, for this uh, event. And uh, we are really obliged to you because I know you are uh, you have a very hectic schedule. You are busy I mean, in so many activities, even after your retirement. And uh, you have been a distinguished uh, diplomat. And uh, I can say that uh, you have been a prolific writer. You have defended India's uh, uh, position at a different uh, world uh, summits, conferences, particularly UN conferences. So I would like to begin with uh, something uh, which uh, concerns your, uh, I can say your position as Secretary East, because during that period, uh, you had uh, managed uh, uh, India's relations with East Asian countries. And East Asia has been a very, very uh, important uh, aspect of India's foreign policy. So, sir, I begin with uh, the questions now. And uh, I think uh, you can very well elaborate on various aspects of uh, the issue. First of all, I would like to ask you about uh, East Asia. As you know, uh, in 2014, the word act was added to India's East Asia policy. And uh, a lot of uh, interpretations were made. A uh, lot of you know, significance was attached to this uh, addition of this work. I, I have talked to so many policy makers and others. And they said that uh, India has always been very, very careful about uh, relations with their neighbors. We have always cared very much uh, uh, so far as our relations with the neighbors are concerned. So I think it started in 19 and it continued. And uh, now in 2014, this act word was uh, used uh, for our uh, East Asia policy. So what is so significant about the addition of this word? How it is uh, a little different? I mean, policy remains the area remains the same, but uh, uh, the act uh, signifies something, which I think you can explain uh, in a much better way. Yes, yeah, so uh, the engagement with uh, the uh, countries of Southeast Asia 
um, really began in the 90s uh, in real earnest when India uh, coined uh, the no peace policy. And after that, we saw there was a gradual improvement in the relationship uh, where India was uh, from a dialogue partner, then it went on to graduate into a strategic partner um, of the uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, but in 2014, uh, the time was actually ripe to change this policy from just look east into act east for a number of reasons. And I'd like to explain those uh, point by point. First, um, there was a realization that if India, India's northeast had to uh, be developed, then it was necessary that there has to be a linkage between the northeast and countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, and that they had to be open to the outside world um, and uh, without that, that region would not develop sufficiently. Uh, so that's exactly what we're seeing right now. You can see that happening on the ground. And that means that the Northeast itself has to be developed. It has to be physically and digitally linked to the countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, and then the trade and investments have to improve. Uh, so this, this government, of course, has been trying very hard to do that. And that is uh, quite evident. Second issue uh, was the question of uh, increasing investments and trade. Uh, it's not that India was not trying to do that because just before 2014, we had actually signed some very important agreements in this field. Uh, the um, agreement on uh, goods uh, with, with ASEAN had been signed and the agreement on um, investment services, investments, of course, uh, had were both being negotiated, but it was not included. And then finally, you know, it's been ratified only now in 2017, uh, 19. Uh, so this has been a whole process. Uh, at the same time, there was this uh, prospect that the RCEP negotiation would begin. Uh, and so commerce and investment became uh, another plank of the Act East policy, where there were a number of components to it. Um, and if you remember that in 2015, uh, Prime Minister Modi also put forward a uh, proposal for a uh, $1 billion um, you know, you know, line of credit for countries of CMLV and Southeast Asia uh, so that they could be connected uh, digitally, digitally as well as uh, physically. And they had to make an application under that in order to make use of uh, that fund. Uh, again, for the CMLV countries, 500 crores were set aside at the same time uh, so that uh, they could get linked to India through trade and investments. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Actis policy also meant uh, that there were three or four major projects that had to be speeded up. The ma first major project was the trilateral highway that would that would connect our northeast uh, through Myanmar to Thailand and then on to uh, the countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, and the second project was the Kaladan multimodal project, which uh, would connect uh, the Kolkata port uh, to uh, uh, to Myanmar and then on to the northeast. So that would be a, a project that would uh, depend on the sea, depend on rail, uh, on road, as well as on the river. Uh, and finally, this connectivity would also connect you to Bangladesh. Uh, those projects are still ongoing. They've still not been completed. Uh, but uh, once they're completed, you know, this will complete a very important uh, segment of the Actis policy. Uh, there are similarly other projects which are going on under the Actis policy. The third element of this was the cultural connect. Because, um, you know, for centuries, uh, India had been connected very closely with countries of Southeast Asia. But uh, unfortunately, there was a gap uh, for many centuries in between when uh, India could not engage with countries. And after independence, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, the power blocks which came into being at that point in time, India was not in the American or the Western camp at that point in time, whereas a lot of countries in Southeast Asia came into that camp. So politically, there was geopolitically, there was a divide. And until 1990s, uh, we did not have that kind of an engagement that we should have had, uh, bringing about a certain gap culturally with countries of this region. Uh, so that connect has been revived, and you can see that happening uh, in terms not just in uh, the ASEAN engagement, also in the Mekong Ganga. Uh, cooperation uh, engagement, setting up the Nalanda University, for example, uh, and making sure that we revive the Buddhist circuit in the Northeast and other places in India so that that Buddhist connect can be revived. And finally, of course, it's the 
projection of the actis uh, of the Lukis policy beyond ASEAN, because now you see an engagement uh, which also encompasses countries in, in, in the Pacific, Australia, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, South Korea, Mongolia, etc. Uh, so it becomes a comprehensive policy uh, which looks at the East as a um, comprehensive segment of the foreign policy, mainly because of the backdrop of the rise of uh, China. Uh, over the years, and, and I think uh, we can talk about that as a separate issue if you wish. Uh, but um, uh, because of that, this engagement of India with countries of this region, ASEAN and beyond, had to be intensified. And that is what ACT signifies. So you very well explained the significance of the word. That is what I wanted from you. I think uh, no, no, else, uh, no one else could have explained it in a better manner. Because you have been handling this uh, division uh, when you were uh, there at the headquarters and all that. Yes. Now you have mentioned about the rise of China. Of course, I was about to come to that. Uh, East Asia and rise of China, they go together. But uh, India also rises. And uh, many people say that uh, uh, these two uh, coexist number one. Secondly, how far China has impacted our relations with the, the countries of the Southeast Asia? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you look at the engagement of China with countries of uh, Southeast Asia, um, very often in India, when we look at it from the Indian prism, we ignore the fact that uh, while India does have a cultural connect, which is very old with countries of the region, the Chinese have also over the centuries had this connect. Uh, and uh, of course, they were uh, not uh, influenced to that extent uh, by Chinese culture because China was pretty insular in the earlier centuries. And India was one of those countries which ventured out, especially the Indian kingdoms uh, of the South were uh, venturing out into the sea. They were naval powers. And uh, therefore, you find Indian influence in countries like uh, Cambodia, for example, Laos, Thailand, etc., yeah. uh, Vietnam, uh, where there's also an ancient Indian civilization. Uh, where is the Chinese uh, that much later through their uh, seafaring voyages? And uh, mainly those voyages were for um, conquest and for subjugation. Uh, so the, there's a difference in uh, how India approached it and how Chinese approached it. Having said that, um, there has been a lot of migration which has happened over the centuries uh, from the southern Chinese provinces, especially from Fujian and from Guangdong, uh, into these countries. And there is a connect between uh, the Thai people, for example, the Homs, who also settled in uh, northeast of India. Uh, even today, you find 10,000 Homs who are settled in our uh, northeast. Uh, and the Yunnan province of China. So there is that, that uh, natural connect which is happened over the centuries. In the current century, we find that the Chinese uh, started trading a lot with countries of Southeast Asia. And uh, that did not start uh, like in the 90s or, or, or uh, later this century, but it had already started in the last century through the migrant community, communities which had gone into Southeast Asia and find out. And they became a prominent base of Chinese diaspora uh, who were in this region and then they started becoming the bedrock of trade and investment between China and countries of this region. So this has brought about um, a strong bond between those communities and the Chinese communities. One thing we must remember is that the system which was practiced in China being uh, uh, under the control of the Communist Party of China was similar to countries in Southeast Asia. Most of them were, uh, were democracies. Under the, under the banner or the leadership of the United States for a very long time. Uh, so ideologically, they were not aligned together. But that uh, one cannot take away the connect between trade and investments uh, between China and the countries of this region. In this century, we've seen that the Chinese have continued to build on that connect and they have continued to expand their influence. Uh, the first part of it was, of course, trade and commerce. And the second part has been, uh, has been uh, connectivity. And the third part has been defense ties. Uh, so therefore, you find, for example, today in countries like uh, Laos and Cambodia um, and um, countries like Myanmar, 
or Thailand, there is a strong Chinese connect uh, of defense uh, cooperation. Uh, of course, India has also been uh, engaging these countries in, in, in the defense uh, and maritime security uh, frameworks. Uh, but at the same time, the Chinese have put forward, um, as you know, the PRI concept, uh, which has happened uh, much later, but already it is more than a decade old now. Uh, and uh, because of the fact that the Chinese provide um, readily loans uh, for construction and uh, much needed infrastructure development. So that has become a very strong pillar of Chinese policy in this region. Um, having said that, the rise of China, um, in, because it's a big country and it has, it comes with finance, it comes with um, a rising sense of self-importance and confidence uh, has made a lot of dependencies uh, of countries in Southeast Asia with China. Uh, so today, if you ask any country in ASEAN, for example, uh, they will not say that they can live without China in the region. Uh, there may be ideological divides, but there's a very strong uh, economic connect. And this is the reason why the Chinese influence has grown. Uh, the Chinese have used that uh, to uh, en enhance their influence in the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, they have also used this for uh, militarization and occupation of uh, some islands uh, in the South China Sea, thereby increasing their suzerainty in the area. Uh, of course, it goes against uh, the norms of international norms like UNCLOS, uh, but uh, there's a certain foreign policy and strategic purpose the Chinese are going about um, with a certain aim of enhancing that influence. And the main aim is to cut down dependency uh, on uh, the sea lanes of communication, uh, to use Myanmar, for example, or Thailand for that matter, uh, as a transit point, uh, which will cut off the Malacca states and take off the Malacca dilemma. Uh, and, the, and the second aspect of this is to moving away and breaking away from the first island chain, moving into the second island chain, and on to the third island chain, and increase the Chinese influence in Pacific, uh, both uh, military for military purposes as far as resource uh, dependency. Uh, so, so, so therefore, we see um, uh, you know a rise of China, and this con has consequences for India uh, because it affects our trade, uh, our freedom of navigation, and the Chinese actions which take place in countries like Myanmar uh, or uh, Thailand, for that matter. Uh, or in the South China Sea affect our freedom of navigation and movement. Um, and this is what um, India is concerned about today. So what should be India is in, in this context? What should India do? So um, I think India has responded by um, creating its own spheres of influence. And I touched upon that briefly while answering your first question. Uh, by a very strong and robust act peace policy. I think it's uh, been uh, quite a bit of a success, uh, even though we've not delivered as far as connectivity projects are concerned, and that's where we are lacking. But our quick impact projects and the ASEAN India Fund have been extremely successful in delivering uh, some very important projects uh, in these countries. Uh, secondly, uh, there are growing ties with uh, most of the countries in Southeast Asia. India also provides development assistance to the Pacific Island states. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is a yearly grant on the basis of which we undertake development projects in the Pacific. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is a certain amount of goodwill that has been created. Uh, in terms of security, I think it's important that India uh, engages with other like-minded countries in the region and keeps up the pressure on China to maintain the South China Sea uh, as, as an open space and not uh, as if it was a Chinese lake uh, because that affects our trade and economic interests. Uh, and for that matter, uh, India is working with the other four countries right now, as you know, a grouping of four democracies, United States, uh, Australia, Japan, and India are in it together. Uh, this is a grouping which uh, uh, is now working on three specific aspects. Uh, it's now been raised to the summit level. Uh, and going forward, um, through that cooperation, it will be able to engage much more with the ASEAN. Uh, sir, uh, you have just mentioned about the Quad and uh, 
how is it going to uh, contain the influence of China, so far as South China Sea is concerned. One thing that uh, comes to our mind is that the uh, US sometimes says pivot to Asia, sometimes say that we are out of Asia. I mean, a little sort of unreliability, uh, so far as the US uh, policy behavior is concerned, is uh, often to be seen. Now, US is uh, very much uh, in favor of Quad uh, and uh, say that uh, this is the only uh, you know, combination uh, of country that can uh, contain China uh, so far as uh, you know, the passage of uh, maritime ships and all this is concerned. So uh, how reliable the uh, US is about Asia? I mean, they have been coming, they have been going out of uh, Asia. I mean, that is something which has uh, to be uh, seen and uh, to be kept to, uh, in mind. Yes, so the pivot to Asia, if you recall, um, was uh, started during Obama administration. Um, that was a time that the yeah. United States was deeply engaged in the Middle East. It was in a quagmire as far as Syria was concerned. Um, and it was also engaged very deeply in other parts of the world, more so in its own neighborhood, where there were um, issues and problems, especially in countries like Venezuela, etc. And that was the time that China grabbed the opportunity to increase its influence in, in the region of Southeast Asia. Uh, and there was a military rise of China, which was not foreseen at that point in time, backed on a very strong economic basis and, and expansion. Uh, and because of that, uh, the region got neglected. Uh, the countries of uh, this region who were dependent on the United States and were bound, in fact, in many cases through treaties and agreements, started looking more and more at China. Uh, and that brought about the realization in the United States that there was no point spreading themselves out too thin. Uh, and therefore, they pulled out of, uh, uh, of Middle East in a large way and concentrated instead, started concentrating itself themselves on uh, Southeast Asia. However, the Obama administration was, was many, not very decisive as to what to do with the rise of China militarily. Uh, they let the Chinese at that point in time, in my view, uh, occupy and uh, populate and uh, um, you know, use the South China Sea to their advantage. There was not much of resistance at that time. If you remember at that time, there was also talk of a G2 grouping uh, where China and US could work together on a number of issues across the world, mainly to, uh, for, for both their benefits. So the US was, uh, in my view, pussyfooting, if I may use a, that word, uh, during that period. It did not um, adopt policies which could have deterred China sufficiently enough. So that was the pivot of Asia for you. Uh, after Tr Obama, Trump administration became much stronger, but they became stronger because they realized that the rise of China meant that the United States would be relegated to a secondary position to China over the years, beyond 2025, somewhere around 2028 or 2030, that the Chinese were going to overtake the United States economically and possibly come very close to uh, them militarily and in the naval field as well. Now, that is something that we can see happening uh, in, in Southeast Asia, where the Chinese forces, the naval forces have expanded. China has also consolidated its, uh, itself militarily, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, it can take on uh, the United States uh, to a reasonable degree if it comes to that. So the power of the United States has been eroded over time, uh, and consequently, the influence over countries of the region has also eroded over time. Um, therefore, coming back to your question about how important it is, uh, the United States under the current administration is continuing the Trump policies, but doing it in a much more cooperative manner to co-opt other countries like the Quad countries uh, to work towards their aim of making sure the Chinese influence does not go unchecked in the region. And in the process, uh, they brought about a revival of the economic content of that policy as well. Uh, so there are bills like uh, area, for example, which started at, uh, during the Trump era, but they've been continued under the uh, Biden administration. And we'll see more of that. One example of that is the Build Back Better World initiative, 
which is a public private partnership uh, and once the funding is available then of course it will be an alternate to uh, the chinese bri and that is the aim of the united states not only to uh, make sure that the chinese influence is met militarily but also uh, met economically because that is what appeals to the countries of southeast asia much more uh thank you very much i am reminded of uh, uh, 2014 uh, when uh, i had gone to china to attend an international conference on east asia and every chinese scholar present there they will always ask me why india is with the us india should not align with the uh, us i told them that we are not in a military pact with the us and uh, Uh, we, we keep an equal distance with uh, all these uh, major powers and all that, and that was the time when the results of the uh, parliament elections had not come. Just five days uh, before the uh, announcement of the result, I was in uh, China, and uh, everybody was asking, "Will Modi win? Will Modi win?" We can just just wait for five days. It is obvious, uh, according to the press reports, that uh, the party is going to win. So. Chinese are very much, you know, perturbed, very much worried about, the, you know, India. Uh, I mean, uh, aligning with uh, the US uh, in any manner, whether it is uh, strategic or any other uh, platform, uh, they are all the time, uh, you know, uh, concerned with the India's uh, alignment with the US. So now I come to uh, some other uh, aspects of the, uh, the discussion. Uh, now I come to. India's bilateral relations. You have written a lot about uh, India's uh, bilateral relations. I will just focus on two of them. One is uh, India's uh, uh, dialogue with the uh, European Union, and second one is about uh, India and Australia. You have been, I know, closely associated with uh, both these relationships. You have been working behind the scene, and uh, you have uh, presented reports and you have uh, expressed your views and all that. First of all, uh, so far, the European Union is concerned. There are certain issues uh, that need our immediate attention, uh, like climate change, connectivity, the trade and investment agreement. So, the problem is not that both are, both sides are not willing; they are willing, but the problem is the pace is very slow, and uh, implementation is the key to solve these issues. So, uh, how you see the prospects of uh, India and European Union? Uh, coming together to an uh, agreement on these various issues. So um, uh, let me start by uh, saying that the uh, geopolitical developments now favor a much uh, closer engagement of India with the EU, uh, which was not the case earlier because the EU uh, saw in China as, as uh, a savior country for the trade and investment and for making sure that their companies continue to prosper in the future. In fact, under the Trump administration, uh, the EU grew closer to China because uh, they saw a, a divide with, with the United States, uh, and they saw in China an opportunity that they will not get. So they pushed away with the investment agreement, uh, which was uh, which was actually concluded during uh, last uh, you know the last uh, term of uh, Merkel uh, with a. Uh, With an added push by Germany because of the um, issues uh, that exist between Germany and China, and the automobile industry in particular would see, to gain a lot from that relationship. Today we see a different kind of sentiment, where the Chinese aggressiveness, uh, starting from the COVID period, uh, and also the fact that the Chinese supplies to Europe fell far short of expectation. Is also a realization that the Chinese have been stealing technology in high technology from European companies. Uh, at the same time, not providing market access to EU companies in China, and uh, that there's been a coercion which has happened uh, for the European companies who work there to part with their technology uh, when you work in a joint venture. Now these uh, things are very serious as far as the European Union is concerned. Uh, not to forget what has happened. By way of human rights violations in Xinjiang, in uh, the lack of a democracy in Hong Kong, uh, the aggressiveness uh, vis-a-vis uh, Taiwan, uh, and of course the general aggressiveness of China in vis-a-vis countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, so that has made the European Union realize that it's not uh, going to be a smooth ride 
uh, with China. Uh, and therefore, the uh, ratification of the investment agreement has been put on hold for a while. How long that will continue, we cannot say and we cannot predict. It will depend a lot on Chinese behavior. But there's no doubt that the European Union uh, sees China from three different prisms. One is as a competitor, one is as a partner, uh, and one, of course, is uh, as a country with whom they have to work with in some manner or the other. Uh, there is no se imminent security threat that they see from China, which countries in the region and the United States see it as. Uh, so there was that, there's that difference that one has to look at. As far as India is concerned, um, uh, I think the later, latest developments have been good. Uh, there's been the leaders uh, the summit which has happened uh, where a roadmap has been agreed upon before that till 2035 of the European Union. But at the same time, there's been agreement of starting an investment agreement, standalone investment agreement, uh, renegotiating uh, the uh, trade, in, trade investment agreement, which has uh, happened after eight years. Uh, and then, um, you know, a geographical indicators agreement. So these three pillars, if they are negotiated uh, with the real earnestness that they deserve, uh, both sides will tend to gain a lot. There is also pressure on uh, the EU uh, to break this down into segments and not talk about a comprehensive agreement, uh, but to talk about um, you know, a piecemeal approach by agreeing to the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, but they are very keen that the investment agreement should be signed as much as soon as possible because we have 6,000 European companies who are working in India today. And for them, it, it, it pinches them to see that uh, there is no investment agreement and there is no legal basis for the investments uh, in India and vice versa. I think Indian companies would also like that. Uh, so we are also looking at a situation where India has pulled out of RCEP. Uh, India is not part of too many uh, free trade agreements around the world. And Indian industry, especially textiles, leather, um, and uh, small and medium enterprises are looking for an agreement with the European Union to increase and you know, enhance their exports and to upgrade their technology. Uh, so the time is just right to move forward on this. Um, it remains to be seen what are the other factors that go into it. I would uh, not say that all the factors that were there earlier have gone away, uh, but at least there is a political will uh, which is much more stronger today. Sir, what about Australia? Uh, you have prepared a very comprehensive report and uh, has been very well uh, welcomed in uh, India as well in Australia. And uh, India has attracted the Australian attention and uh, Australia has also been very, very reciprocal uh, so far as the trade and investments are concerned. So uh, what prospects do you see? Uh, what are your uh, observations uh, on the future of uh, trade and investment uh, by each other? So I worked on an Australia Economic Strategy Report for one and a half years uh, with CIA and with KPMG. Yeah. And this report was commissioned by the Minister of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, and then it was carried forward by the current Minister for Commerce and Industry, Mr. Piyush Goyal, who actually released it in November uh, 2020. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, Australia is an ideal partner for India as far as our development and need for technology and, and uh, the raw material for progress in future is concerned. The, what we call the new tech um, uh, industries. And that includes um, lithium-based industries, the e-mobility program, water solutions that we need for this country, um, the use of hydrogen in the mix of energy, uh, and of course, uh, you know, issues like power grid balancing uh, and things like that, where Australia has been a pioneer. Uh, they've automated their mining industry and brought in safety to a large degree, uh, where India can benefit a lot from, from, from that technology. Uh, and I think out of the 49 minerals that have been identified by India as key uh, and strategic for our future development, 21 out of them are available in Australia. Uh, and Australia and India have signed an agreement on, uh, on, on these rare earths and, and, and lithium. Uh, and therefore, going forward, that will be a big area of cooperation. Another area of cooperation is healthcare. 
uh, vocational training. Uh, there is a uh, science and technology cooperation, which is ongoing with Australia. And in fact, working on very specific uh, issues with regard to agriculture enhancement, uh, storage technologies and things like that. So therefore this relationship is going to be extremely valuable. Uh, we don't have a free trade agreement with Australia and I've advocated in my report that we must have, uh, we have, we should have completion of this free trade agreement so that we can export more of our items like textiles or gems and jewelry which actually suffer uh, because the other competitors are able to sell it much more uh, cheaply. Uh, so, um, you know, in order to enhance our exports to that country, uh, and also the fact that now Indian diaspora is going to 700,000 in Australia, uh, it's a favorite destination for Indian students today. Before the lockdown, we had 120,000 Indian students. So it's a very important country, and, and it's, it's important to also grow because of the security dimension uh, of India and Australia ties, which have grown. Australia now takes part in Malabar, it's part of the port. Uh, and in future, we're going to work together on many issues, including vaccine distribution rollout in Southeast Asian countries. So all this makes Australia a very important country. Sir, Indian diaspora has played a very vital role in cementing relations between the two countries. I know on a personal basis, uh, my daughter is there, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. she has now uh, uh, got the uh, Australian citizenship. They have settled down there. And she tells me that uh, local people, they admire Indian culture. They admire Indian food. You will find so many uh, food outlets. I mean, the whole uh, streets are named after Indian food, uh, particularly Gujarati food and all that. So, uh, the role of Indian diaspora has been very, very uh, vital, very, very uh, useful. And uh, I think uh, the Australian government also takes care of uh, Indian diaspora. It is their, uh, whatever we, uh, their grievances or their problems and all that. So that has been a very uh, bright chapter of uh, India's relations with uh, Australia. And uh, the number is growing. I had mm -hmm. been there in uh, 2008, and uh, when this student's problem was there, you know, some uh, uh, brutal uh, stabbings and all things that taken place. But they were not uh, racial in nature. I talked to so many Australian uh, people. They said they are not racial in nature. I mean, they are criminals. They are drugists. I mean, those who try to loot the Indian students uh, at odd hours when they returned uh, after their work in the night and all that. So there was a little, uh, you know, uh, misunderstanding between the two countries and things were sorted out very quickly. And uh, that way, Indian diaspora has a role to play uh, in uh, the bilateral relation. So now I come to another and very, very uh, important uh, aspect of uh, our relations with a major power. Uh, I come to the current scenario. Uh, two days back, uh, US Secretary of State Blinken was in India. And he expressed uh, his concern uh, about three things, about Indo-Pacific, about uh, Afghanistan, and about uh, uh, democracy and democratic values and all that. So, so far as uh, Australia, I mean, this uh, Afghanistan and Indo-Pacific are concerned, both have, I mean, just similar concerns, and they want to come together to uh, find a solution to all these issues. So far as this uh, uh, Alliance for Democracy has uh, been put forward by Biden administration. And uh, the human rights issue, uh, that has found some, you know, dissenting notes in uh, American society. I mean, from uh, not on official level, but uh, there are some reports, there are some voices. I mean, they express concern about human rights issue in India. So how do you look at it? How both countries can uh, come together to uh, remove this initiative. So I think, um, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the relationship with the United States, it's uh, progressed a lot, uh, especially as far as the defense aspect is concerned, because we have now a $20 billion trade in, um, in, in, in defense, which has happened over the past few years. There have been four major agreements that have been signed for interoperability uh, between India and the United States. 
uh, we work together in a number of uh, number of uh, exercises um, in different regions of the world, uh, and we are cooperating uh, through the Quad, uh, and in fact across the world on a number of issues. Um, currently, of course, climate change is a focus of attention. There are only about sixty dialogue mechanisms that we have uh, with the United States, practically at all levels. Uh, and uh, you know, President uh, uh, Biden and Prime Minister Modi have already spoken on a number of occasions. They participated together in the Quad Summit, the G7 Summit, the Climate Leaders, all virtual events, of course. And they're going to possibly meet in person during the Quad Summit, which is going to come up. Um, now, quite likely at the bilateral uh, at the bilaterals when when that takes place. Uh, I think what is going to be important is how they would definitely talk about the geostrategic aspects of where both of them uh, are involved. And democracy is a very important pillar because both countries are democratic countries. So the Biden administration lays a lot of stress on, on democracy. And of course, it lays a lot of stress being a democratic government on human rights as well. Uh, I would not say that uh, there is any misunderstanding on that score. I think that's not a uh, not a correct perception to say that because uh, during the current visit also we had issues that uh, rose with respect to uh, human rights and, and democracy, uh, and there was a candid exchange of views which you've seen come out in the media as well, uh, where um, India also said that uh, you know both countries need to improve the human rights uh, situation. We are not perfect democracies, but to improve that aspect as well. And we'll work together for that. And I think we've committed ourselves to work together on the climate change issue as well. India has done well as far as climate change is concerned. Transition from uh, fossil fuels onto alternate sources of energy, the pace has been good. And we hope to progress because that's also important for India to develop as a, as a country going forward. Uh, finally, there is the issue of, uh, um, you know, the Quad, uh, you know, how we take that forward. And of course, the Quad is now focusing, uh, as you saw, on three aspects. One of them is climate, but the other one is vaccines. And when that investment from the United States or Japan takes place into India, into biological key, uh, that will create a new dependency, a new area of cooperation going forward for uh, many, many years in the future. So it's not just defense, but we want to branch out into other areas as well. And the most important aspect is the technology cooperation, especially the defense technology cooperation, uh, where uh, we see United States as a very important partner uh, in terms of uh, uh, next generation of technologies, and that includes telecommunication, which is also something which is being discussed in the court context. Uh, so I think all in all, it's a uh, still an evolving relationship, but a very important relationship. Um, earlier, when we were discussing, we talked about uh, not creating uh, dependencies on any country, and India's uh, you know, basic um, premise in foreign policy remains the same, that we want to maintain strategic autonomy uh, going forward in our foreign policy, and that's what we will strive to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, in the end, uh, I would like to I request you to uh, allow my FPRC intern, uh, Zoya. She wants to ask a question. Too. Yes. Thank you, sir. Zoya, you can ask her question. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so, sir, my question is, how do you view India and China's engagement with the Taliban in deciding the future of Afghanistan once the U.S. withdrawal is complete? So, if you, if you are asking about... Uh, um, what will happen as far as engagement with the Taliban is concerned? I think India is, um, as, as far as India is concerned, has so far uh, said that any power sharing arrangement or power arrangement in Afghanistan must be based on the will of the people. That's the basic premise. If the Taliban take over Afghanistan by force, and that's also something which is expressed by the United States, uh, then we will see that regime in Afghanistan become a pariah state. And we agree uh, essentially with that, uh, with that uh, assessment. Uh, India has not uh, engaged very actively with the Taliban in the past because we, uh, we understood that the Taliban was talking to the Afghan government, which is a 
legitimately elected government in Afghanistan. Lately, we've seen that a number of countries in the region have started engaging Taliban uh, directly as well. Uh, you saw that there's been some interactions in the recent past uh, with uh, the Taliban as far as India is concerned as well. Uh, but our, our premise remains the same, uh, that uh, the Taliban have to cooperate with the elected government or come to an arrangement where the people of Afghanistan are able to choose their own government going forward and that they should not have a government which is imposed from outside. Uh, the Chinese situation is slightly different uh, because the Chinese are working in Afghanistan, as you know, and they, are, they have interests in the, uh, the mineral uh, resources in Afghanistan. They have interest also in ensuring that their uh, Xinjiang region, which is quite restive, uh, does not uh, uh, feel the effect of radicalism from Afghanistan. Uh, and therefore, the last meeting which the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had with the Taliban representatives in Beijing, it was made quite clear that their influence um, as far as uh, working with uh, with those who are working for an independent Turkmenistan, uh, independent uh, uh, Turkish region in, in Xinjiang uh, would not be tolerated. And therefore, the Chinese interest is quite clear uh, that they do not want that region to be radicalized. Uh, so from that perspective, we have different slightly varying interests, but of course, all these countries in the region, including China, including India, would like to see a stable and a peaceful Afghanistan going forward. And in that context, uh, you know, we will see an engagement with Taliban with different emphasis uh, and uh, with a different uh, point of view. Uh, but uh, the ultimately, everybody's aim remains the same. Thank you, sir.